Hi, I'm your host, Sam Fish, and you're listening to The Fish Bowl. Today's guest is Edward Numier. Ed is most known for co-writing the original 1987 Robocop, as well as the 1997 sci-fi action film Starship Troopers. Today we'll be talking with Ed about those films and some other projects. Ed Numier, welcome to The Fish Bowl. Hi, how you doing? Uh, it's very nice to find myself here. <laughs> Great to have you on. Um, of course, uh, I am a huge fan of your work as well as Michael's. Um, let's let's talk RoboCop first. Sure, whatever. We start wherever you like. Okay. Um, well, first, I, actually, before we get into RoboCop, um, let let's talk about uh, what got you interested in film and leading up to the whole, like, idea, development, and getting um, RoboCop made? Okay, well, uh, uh, you know, let me see if I can get through this oft-told story, uh, you know, in a, in, a, in a clip, in a fast way. Um, I, uh, you know, I, my, my answer has changed a little over the years. I was always interested in movies. I remember having religious experiences of sorts that you can have when you're a kid, in certain movies, I would say they captivated me immediately. That experience of going somewhere, uh, you know, and sitting in a dark room and watching this thing unfold in front of you, um, and I have a lot of memories of that, uh, which I think people who a lot of people who you know come to love movies do or work in movies do. So, you know, I, I think one of the big big moments there was Lawrence of Arabia, which I saw kind of by chance when I was thirteen in a in a nearly empty house, uh, and I just was struck by it in such a way. It's, you can only call it a religious experience because it, it was overwhelming. I, I, after that, all I wanted to think about was doing, how could I do a movie? Um, uh, Steven Spielberg says a similar thing with Lawrence, so it's not a unique story. Um, in any event, uh, jumping right ahead, uh, I also grew up in a very interesting place. I grew up in Marin County in, in the town of San Samo in the 70s. I was a teenager there. And uh, some, in, uh, some in your audience may know that George Lucas also lived in San Samo uh, in the 70s and was making movies like American Graffiti and Star Wars. And uh, I was, a, a lot of my friends were in American Graffiti in the dance scenes and it was shot everywhere around where I lived so I was pretty aware of the idea that not only were there movies that I loved but that you could not make movies and that literally someone around the block who I never saw or met was making movies and we uh, I remember going to a kind of a famous screening of American Graffiti in San Francisco uh, which was the you know when they showed it to the studio with an audience for the first time and, you know, again, when you're 16 years old, you kind of think, well, it's happening in my neighborhood. So, you know, that it, it's sort of normal. And then Star Wars came out. And, uh, you know, I was in college by then, still thinking about whether I had the nerve to move down to Hollywood, you know, uh, move down to L.A. I had an idea I should go to the UCLA Film School. And, uh you know, then Star Wars came out, and it was just such an overwhelming idea of film, and, you know, it shook the world, really. But it really made me, who had grown up, you know, down the street from this guy, sort of, think, you you really could do this. And so off I went. I went to UCLA. I got into film school there. Uh, I sort of rubbed shoulders with Michael there, but he was like a, he was ahead of me, uh, and he was kind of a star. He was a cinematographer or known as, and you know, very creative guy. But we didn't really run into each other until after I left UCLA, I went to uh, work at Universal as an executive uh, through the story department. I read scripts, I, I, I learned how to sort of read scripts. I became a, a reader, uh, and then eventually I became an executive at Universal. And it was during that year that I realized I didn't really want to be an executive, although I had respect for these fellows. And a lot of the development of the executive, the business side of RoboCop sort of fell into place after my, my brief period there, working for, with Lou Wasserman and Sid Scheinberg and that old school crew that had once run Hollywood. And they informed the story of RoboCop, the executive suite stuff, the 
the boardroom, Morton, all of those characters kind of were born there. Uh, really, the development of Robocop goes back to me, me as a reader, a desperate kind of 24-year-old character in Hollywood, or 23, I think, working at Columbia Pictures, which was then next to the Warner Brothers a lot. And my office uh, was just next door to this giant set. Uh, which was the for the movie Blade Runner. But, you, you know, I, no one would tell you that then. Uh, but I used to go to work on the set after my regular day job because it was such a big production, no one knew who anybody was practically. So I would just go hang around that set. And I did that for three or four days. And uh, uh, one of those nights, I think the last night I was there, the big, big night with all the, you know, it was Harrison Ford was there and Sean Young was there and they had the blue car, which they called Spinner and uh, Eddie Almos was there and I watched them shoot a bunch of scenes and it was after that night I had this idea really sprung in my head for Robocop, the title, Robocop, the guy who is a, a robotic policeman and a kind of a ironic future having to do with, you know, it probably started because it's such an atmospheric set, you know, and I and I remember thinking, oh, well, if Robocop was here, he would be wondering why people act the way they do. And that was right, right. sort of an important image that came in. So that was the, the beginning of it. And it was four years of thinking and work, being an executive. And then when I was an executive and had worked out much of this tale, in walked Mike Miner again, who had come in along with some other uh, UCLA film students that I had I had looked back to UCLA and said, oh, who were the really, uh, you know, smart people there who were doing things? And Michael was one of them. And he came in and we kind of began our relationship in that way. Uh, and uh, I, he was very interested to do something. Uh, and I said, well, you know, uh, I'm working on this story about a robot. And he said, oh, my God, I'm shooting a rock video about a robot. <laughs> and it went from there a little bit, and it uh, was a kind of a very energized and pleasant experience writing, uh, taking what was a treatment that I had written into a script. It took the first draft was, you know, kind of a lot of fun in a way, uh, in a way that things would never be fun again. Uh, and uh, it sold rather quickly because we had two or three people who were interested in it, and one of them was a guy I knew, John Davison, who uh, turned out to be the first giant lucky break we got after that because he was the best producer you could imagine uh, to make this movie. Anyway, that's, I think that's the long answer, as short as I can do it, to your question. Uh. <laughs> awesome. Well, a lot of information in, uh, in about 13 and a half minutes there. <laughs> well, boy, that's uh, I got to get that down to five. Sorry. <laughs> it, it, don't worry about it. I usually have my interviews go about an hour max, anyways, so we're good on time. <laughs> good, good. Can we have? Uh, yeah, we have forty-seven minutes now to talk about something else. Right. Right. <laughs> um, uh, now, I, yeah. I just I kind of want to say that um, you know my major is, is screenwriting. Um, I'm in my senior year at Point Park University here in Pittsburgh. Uh -huh. Fantastic. <clears throat> and, um, you know, I'm actually taking a, a class called Story Analysis right now, which is basically teaching us to be script readers. Um, and I've had a chance to read um, All You Need Is Kill, which became uh, Edge of Tomorrow. Um, yeah, hey, how was the script uh, that you read versus the movie you saw? Okay, yeah, exactly, exactly. How was it, I mean, for you? Um, the script... All You Need yeah. Is Kill was actually uh, a good bit different from what Edge of Tomorrow, uh, you know, came okay. to be on the screen. And I bet. I actually kind of liked the, the script, the original script, more than what the film turned out to be. Yeah, I, I, I would somehow, I don't know, I kind of like the movie. It's, I mean, because it's sort of, uh, it actually, they did things we couldn't afford to do in, uh, in, in Starship Troopers, but, right. and I like the guys involved in it. I, I actually thought, oh, I bet you the original movie was worked out, the original script was, had, was probably a little more nuanced in some of the alien world building and probably who the character, and I bet yeah, it was fun. Yeah, like, I, I like the movie a lot, you know, I, I saw it in theaters, not this past it's a good year. movie. 
It's a great movie. You know, I love seeing Tom Cruise in those um, sci-fi action roles. Um, but the, 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 you know, characters in the original script, uh, like, like Rita uh, Vitalsky, that Emily Blunt's character was, um, is extremely different in the script than it is portrayed on the big screen. And so is Cage, Tom Cruise's character as well. It just, it's just little variations of things that I really find interesting when reading the, the original scripts versus what makes <clears throat> it to the screen. And, um, you know, I like before I even got into doing screenwriting, um, when I was doing technical theater, one of the assignments we had to do for one of the classes was, you know, find some scripts. And I found the website simplyscripts.com. Right. And it's an amazing website. It has like literally thousands of scripts being all from, you know, ones that are old to ones that are just being added as new movies come out. And, I, you know, one of the first I had, you know, some favorite films growing up that I'm like, I need to just read the script. And, you know, one of them was Predator. One of them it was RoboCop. And, you know, RoboCop, the script, just, just when I saw the movie and for the first time and got a little older and had seen it 500 times since, it made me just, like, really got an understanding for how film worked, you know, with storyline and everything. Um, the, the way the, the film was shot you know, with having um, the commercials and then mm -hmm. going from the commercials to reality and cutting back. I mean, that that just made me want to be like, I need to read this script, you know, right. to get an understanding. And it, it was it was that that type of script was had not been done, at least, you know, to my knowledge um, with the way it was done and then translated to the screen. I mean, that was kind of like one of the first um, types of scripts in that genre to do something like that. And I was wondering, uh, like, what, 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 what was kind of going through your head when putting, putting it on paper to translate to the screen? Well, I mean, I really, that was something I always wanted to do. I wanted this, I wanted it to be funny and, uh, uh, and have a commentary that was running through it about media. I, I was raised in a media family. Uh, my, both my parents had worked in uh, newspapers, journalism, and uh, you know, um, I kind of liked television news that was funny and stuff like that, you know, that, that Saturday Night Live had done, you know, and stuff like that. So that was something I was always trying to push into with an action movie. And it was tentative, I would say. In the first draft, there is only one media break. And it's kind of, and some people were like, hmm, why, why is that there? And eventually people, including Michael, got comfortable. And by the second draft, we committed to this structure that, would, that I had, you know, I had basically act curtains in mind uh, that would uh, have these kind of funny bits in it and would also carry exposition, which is what it really is great for. And, uh, but, you know, then it allows you to write you know, gags about the future and be funny if you're, uh, if you can. And that's what I really liked about RoboCop, that it was both my, the original conceit, conceit that I had for RoboCop was that it should be hard action, very tough, but it should also be funny. And I thought there was a relationship and it's not an original thought either. James Bond had already started playing around with this, but there was a relationship I felt that the, if you show, if you really shock the audience, it fit Fill them full of tension and who knows what else. And if you made them laugh, I had noticed when I did this to my friends, say, uh, that, that the laugh was huge. That the re laugh, the release of that tension in the laugh was a really big deal. So that was kind of what I was in pursuit of. And I think you see it in scenes and in the, the, the media breaks. But back to something you said earlier, which is how to learn to be a screenwriter. And I must say that... You seem, I mean, I agree with your approach because that's sort of what I stumbled into, which was I was a reader. Uh, I read scripts and I read a lot of scripts. I read a lot of bad scripts. And I also 
And this is, I think, what you're doing and what people who are listening to this can do if they want, is you can really read the scripts now. You can read good scripts, scripts of the movies that really captured you. And you can read them. Uh, you can find them. It's just a matter of reading, and, right. which, is, you know, which is not easy uh, to read all this shit. But if you really read these things and study them, and if you have a favorite movie, and you find the book, and you read the book, and you find the script, and you read the script, and you watch the movie, and, you know, as they say, repeat, uh, 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 you know, you can really learn how these things were put together. Uh, they're, you know, movies. Movies at their best, let's just talk about on a script level, narrative level, are these intricate little machines that you can build. And the more subtle you are with it, the more the audience, the more entertaining you are, the more the audience loves you and loves it, forgetting the you part of it. They just love what they're watching. They love the experience. And that's, that's what you're sort of going for. So anyway, the first time I wrote a movie, after you know five, seven years of reading, 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 uh, scripts and talking about scripts and being a development executive for a little while and working on scripts, I wrote this, you know, I sat down and structured this script. I wrote it as a, you know, a treatment and then Michael and I started writing it together and uh, the the idea of having real act rights in it, you know, the first act ends and there's commercials like on television. And then you cut back to reality and you see some of the story being threaded through. And so it's a commentary and it's, you know, when it works, it's fun. I did the same thing in Starship Troopers in a different way. But that there, uh, uh, you know, I sort of went for it as more of, a, of an Internet idea. But I think the, the notion of information and the message we hear from authority versus what we see in life is an amusing idea that gets worked through in RoboCop and, and Starship Troopers as well. Right. I mean, you know, Starship Troopers. You know, I, I don't. I don't want to get to that just yet. But, okay. But let me just say that that film. Holy shit! <laughs> holy shit! That that movie. I I my my. That was one of the first R-rated movies I got to see <laughs> in theaters because. My dad, you know, I, I had I had seen RoboCop. Well, first of all, you know, go, going back to um, to what kind of gets us into film and our passion and everything. Um, I was born in 1988, um, so a year after the first RoboCop came out, and my actual legit very first memory is being in a theater. That's actually right down the street from me. That has closed. Uh, it's been closed about ten years now, unfortunately. Um, yeah, that's that's part of the story yeah, too. <laughs> yeah, um, but I saw Back to the Future Part Three in mm. theaters, um, and I actually have a memory of climbing over the seats and everything, and and you know actually seeing it in the theaters, and it's I think. Like how you said, it's kind of like a religious experience. Um, to me, it kind of was because, you know, that that memory, it's my first memory. And, you know, that, that kind of says it all. And it just set me on a path um, from that point on to just having a love for film. And I, I've been a huge... Uh, Schwarzenegger fan since I was I was old enough to know who this guy was and <laughs> and in fact my uh, another uh, Paul Verhoeven film uh, my dad had Total Recall on VHS and at age you know three I I saw the cover and I I knew who Schwarzenegger was at age three and I yeah. said to my dad you know, can I watch this? And he's like, absolutely not. Flash forward to my fourth <laughs> birthday. The I said, I said Dad, friends. right, I said, Dad, can I watch this movie? He's like, absolutely not. Flash forward to my fifth birthday. I said, Dad, can I watch this movie? And he's like, what the hell? Ten years old. Five years old. Oh, 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 fifth birthday, I'm sorry. Fifth birthday, yeah, five <laughs> Okay, so old. you got to see, you know, Total is probably the least disturbing of the three movies you could have watched of Paul's. <laughs> right, right. 
Of course, I think I I, I wasn't even in uh, in middle school when I, I got to check out Basic Instinct, but okay. Well, you see, this is the thing that I think is interesting about Paul. I'm glad we we should talk about Paul a little bit because Paul is like the 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 next great stroke of luck that occurred in making RoboCop. I mean, Davison brings you aside from his great and intelligent script notes, uh, which were always good and reasonable and kind. Um, he brings you people like Rob Bottin, Phil Tippett, and the guys who really came up with this stuff. And then there's Paul. And Paul is a world-class uh, filmmaker. He's just an amazing guy. Uh, I say this, and I have to be careful, because he's also been a friend for you know 35 years now. Uh, but he's really, and, and, and what I've learned in 35 years is he's better than you think he is. He's always better than you think he is. And it's very hard to even say, you know, I cannot imagine, and I, there were other directors who wanted to do this, I just can't imagine RoboCop being the movie it is. And it is very much the script and more uh, without, without uh, Paul. Uh, Paul Verhoeven, it, you you have grown up loving his stuff, and you know Total Recall, uh, which I didn't write uh, or have anything to do with. I was around a little bit, you know, is very much like in keeping with uh, RoboCop and Starship in a way, isn't it? I mean, they're all kind of yeah. the same feeling, and so there's a trilogy of films he made, and uh, I got to write a couple of them. That's great. Uh, and I really feel more and more kind of, well, certainly indebted, uh, but I also learned a great deal about, you know, movies and stuff from him, too. So uh, that's been, you know, the real secret of, of making a good movie uh, beyond trying to write a good script is to find a good director. Right. And in this case, uh, there was sort of cosmic destiny, in it, I think. Absolutely. And, you know... I, I've probably seen all of Paul's films at this point, and you know I, 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 I did wait. To, my I think my dad knew about uh, striptease, and uh, or no, uh, yeah, uh, no showgirls. It was showgirls. Showgirls. Well, yeah, showgirls, showgirls is really an adult. Uh, yeah, uh, an adult enterprise pleasure yeah. for some, <laughs> and uh, you. Yes, I, I think it would almost be wasted on a child if, if, if and also probably completely inappropriate in this day and age oh, oh yeah oh yeah. yeah i mean i i my dad was like you're waiting at least till you're in high school to see that that's at least until you're 12 right you know? right <laughs> so you're on that he's, he's like you know he was like 12 you can see basic instinct you know i'm waiting till high school to to you know fr freshman year of high school to you see uh, showgirls. All right. Well, that's appropriate. Showgirl, high school and showgirls. That's right, I right. think that's the right. You know, I think your dad, your dad had a very good roadmap of the world. Um, <laughs> yeah, he yeah. was because he was like, you know, because you know he was showing me like Road Warrior and and Tales from the Crypt and you know all yeah. these like H.P. Lovecraft movies. Yeah. Like when I when I was like not even in middle school yet. But, you know, and then, of course, when, like, the nudity would come up for most of those films up until I was, you know, at least in middle school, he would he would cover my eyes at the nudity. But ah. when I, but whenever there is, you know, extreme gore or, you know, violence of some sort that I could watch. Well, <laughs> you know, we have uh, we have, uh, you know. I'll tell you something, violence and gore is is shocking as it is, and we could probably do, you know, 20 minutes on that. Uh, you know, it's also, it's kind of metaphor. And again, something that Paul, there's a real difference between what real violence appears to look like right. uh, in documentary or on screen uh, and what Paul's doing. Paul is, is if you look at it, his, his choreography, his staging of everything is so beautiful and elegant. Whether it's Basic Instinct or RoboCop, the, watch the staging. Watch the way the camera and the actors move. Oh yeah, it's that's, fucking amazing. That, that's, that's, that's where he's. That's where his. That's where a great deal of his genius can be seen. And you. And it just looks so much easier than it is. But it's all extremely worked out in a way that looks natural and normal. Absolutely. And it that looks is. good all the time. It's really interesting that he, how he does that is really interesting. I mean, right. he does it because he's got taste and he's really smart, but that it is almost not, you don't notice him doing it all. 
but he is truly directing your attention to the things that he wants you to see in a wonderful way. He's anyway. I could just go on. No, no, no. Because I was, I was, I was going to say something on that actually. Because please, because you know, talking about RoboCop, Starship Troopers, Total Recall, even Hollow Man. You know, it, it's like the way he he does the zoom ins, zooms outs. And and getting you know the certain angles with the shots and everything. I mean, well, the way know, he visualizes the world yeah, is exactly really neat and extremely sophisticated. Um, what I would say is to back to the screenwriting part of it. And you know, my experience working with Paul may be summed up as fifty thousand breakfast meetings over thirty years. <laughs> uh, you know, just sitting and talking and sitting and talking about you know, the story and clarifying the story and what could happen and what would be fun here. Uh, and that's my experience of how you do these things. Um, and, you know, really what you have to do, uh, all young screenwriters should think this way, is you have to remember that this is a visual medium. And it began as a silent picture. Right. So as much as a good line of dialogue can save your life and, and turn the world, uh, it should always, first and foremost, be thought of visually. How am I telling the story visually? How am I, what is the metaphor, even shot-wise, in your head as you're writing this thing? Because it's all about focusing this down into a very specific, visual, continuing flow of imagery. That's the language. And although screenwriters are not encouraged to write shot of this, shot of that, you kind of got to think that way. And the more you think visually, and the less you explain. I saw a movie yesterday that I'm not going to mention. It's got big stars in it. It's really well intended uh, drama. And you know, if if they're doing this, they were doing this thing that I hate, which is like having a line of dialogue saying, you know, it's going to get really hard on character A and character B in about five minutes, and then you cut to character A and character B, and they're going, God, it's really hard. It's like being in a vice. <laughs> and um, you know, it's that kind of dot to dot writing. And that's not, to me, what really great movies are. That's, it's just easy that way. It's like radio. And I think that you have to find a way to make an immersive visual experience where people also talk. Sometimes they sing. But it's an immersive emotional experience, and it's visual. It's visceral. So anyway, you have to think about what you're seeing, not about what you're you know, telling people. Absolutely. My, uh, my screenwriting teacher's last teacher... Um, his name's, uh, well, the one I'll mention, his name's uh, Steve Cuden. And um, Steve always, you know, reiterates to us, you know, the past three years that I've, I've been at Point Park and to all his students, you know, the, the famous saying he, he says is, don't, don't say it, show it, you know, and that's kind of stuck with me. For a long, well, you know, that's a, long a very, time. that's a very elegant way of saying it too. You've got to show it, and you really have to. And it's very easy to slide into having a character tell you some shit. And I'll just tell, I will say to everyone out there who cares about this: when you have a character telling the audience shit, the audience is not listening. Exactly. It's because film. It's a is fundamental thing, and it's not that they're lazy. It's they actually it does the medium, the medium of of film. In this case, and I'm talking about, you know, in a, in a theater kind of film, uh, does not carry that kind of expositional information well at all. It's really hard to get it in, uh, to not be noticed, and to, to actually have it penetrate. You, you know, anyway, enough of that. <laughs> well, I, I was just going to say, it's like film is a visual medium. It really and, is. And, you know, if, you know, people don't go to the movies to see people talk. They, they see that's part of it, but they don't go to just to see people talk. They go no. to see all the elements that go along with the people talking, which is more of the visual than the actual dialogue. And, you know, dialogue is extremely important in a film. It can make or break and take the, the audience out of, um, you know, like the the willingness suspension of disbelief as, as we're taught. <laughs> um, but you know, it's like, it's the truth, you know, I mean, it, it can, 
bad dialogue can make or break, you know, well, dialogue in general can make or break a movie. And, but, you know, people, nevertheless, people go to see a film for the, the visual aspects more than just the talking. And, well, they go for a visual narrative and the camera, right. that's why staging and camera, camera relationship to the story, how the camera moves is when it's working best, it's a storytelling device. And, you know, that's the, the highest of the form is where the visual language is telling you the story. Uh, the, old, the, the, the thing I always remember is Elie Kazan is coming to Hollywood to become a director. And he's always worked on the stage. And he gets to meet all the greats. And he finally ends up talking to John Ford, uh, who starts in silence. Uh, and John Ford tells him, look, you put the script aside and, and, and visualize the picture on location when you're there. Think of it as a silent film. No di Imagine it is a film without dialogue, even though there will be dialogue. And, and, and he's right. And if you look at Spielberg, uh, you know, when he's really hitting all nines, he just does everything in camera, visually. He's telling you a story. He, he's the secret. Look at him. He's the secret to what I mean uh, visually. You know, and, and other directors do it as well in different ways. But you can really see it in Spielberg. Um, that's the whole key of film making right there. Right. And it's actually my, again, I'll, I'll bring up my, my teacher, Steve Cuden. He, he constantly, um, tells us this, uh, this, uh, what is it? Um, it's like a, a phrase, uh, Spielberg actually, uh, uses on a regular basis. He says, I like to make movies that I can hold the idea in the palm of my hand. Well, simplicity is such a uh, beast in these things. Uh, yeah, I get it. That's, uh, I mean, really you want a simple, simple, simple uh, idea if you can get it. Because, and simple doesn't mean like uh, dumb or thin. It means just right. really right. clear, you know, you're not, you, you know, you're not all tarted up. It's, it's like as soon as you get too, and I've done it. Uh, you get too brick bracky with everything. As soon as everything is all wonderful and elegant, and it's like, oh my God, this is so incredibly complicated, and, and aren't I a wonderful writer? Then you have made a mistake because you don't want to see any of that stuff. You want it to be there, but you want it to just be there in the right ways. You want the audience to see it, and it can't be too complicated. It has to be running towards something interesting, I think. Absolutely. And you know, a lot of stuff that I'm, I've learned uh, the past two years and now my third year at Point Park University in, in their film or cinema program, um, it's, it's, it's definitely helped me to not only craft and develop my, my own storytelling uh, abilities, but it, it's given me like a, a, a history a film that you know, sure, like I, I knew a you know a lot more than um, any of the other students in my freshman year, and I still know a lot more than any of my senior students in my senior year. But you know, I still there's you know there's always room to learn more. And yeah, I think the the I I, I agree, and I think that the complexity of what the movies as we know call we sometimes still call them you know the whole entertainment idea if it's movie based which is two hour theatrical experience is you know i mean it, it i keep you know it's really being modified right now by the market and by the internet and by all that kind of stuff and and movies as you uh grew up with you know you saw back to the future 3 in theaters say, you know, that was the end of a certain way of, of exposition. It's still going to be out there, but it's certainly changed. The content has changed. The, you know, a lot of these things are going to be coming to you at home now in different ways uh, through Netflix, say, you know, and not, right. not the And, uh, you know, RoboCop was something you never saw on the screen. You saw it on VHS and on television a million times maybe, but you watched it that way. And even when that movie was being made, I remember the DP saying, oh, most of my uh, uh, work is now seen on the small screen. That is the truth. Uh, Yosef Kano said that, I remember, at one point. Anyway. Well, it's the truth. It's, it's you know, it, it's how, 
the, the industry changes as times change. It always, it always. I, I, I was reading a, a sort of a murder mystery uh, set uh, in the, at the beginning of the of silence, um, and you know, much stays the same, and much, uh, but technology is always the driver, and it really changes everything as you go along over and over again in the movie business, sound, color, television, you know, all these things are, are, are what drive the form. And so it's going to be interesting to see, you know, right now we have these giant tentpole movies that are made and they're, you know, they're big movies, they're animation movies. They, they take years to make and, and they employ thousands of people and they cost, you know, they cost and they cost and they cost. They cost 130, 150, 200 million dollars. And then they are marketed around the globe for set the same. And that's a really different set of requirements than when we made Robocop, you know, or we could make a movie that was, you know, pretty small in st scale and yet it was still fun and it somehow told a story that was entertaining. I think it'd be very difficult to get, you know, that movie made these days the same way, you know. Uh, oh, absolutely. I, I, I'm, I'm in a grant 110% there. And it's actually... I think you know it's kind of it's kind of like a letdown almost that um, creativity isn't isn't kind of like you know looked as as greatly upon as it was in in you know the eighties and even in the nineties you know and because I don't have any issue with you know comic book movies and, and stuff like no, that. No, I mean I they're, love they're them, fine. You know, but. I, I, I miss, you know, I, you know, I miss seeing, you know, originality, you know, I miss seeing, you know, just new concepts, you know, and, it, it, and don't get me wrong, I, I loved, um, you know, the RoboCop remake that you guys worked on, that was great, you know, and I, oh, and wait, I just just for the record, yeah, uh, because credit is not is due where it is due. Uh, right, we right. were arbitrated into that okay. because by the Writers Guild because uh, they felt a, a the the people who read it felt uh, that the script the, the remake script you know had that much of our original script in it, and uh, Michael uh, can tell you more about that if because uh, he was very involved in that arbitration. Uh, but, you know, I did talk with um, the, the writer of the remake. We had a lovely lunch together. He's a good guy. He has his own RoboCop story, which is hysterical. Uh, and, um, you know, I, I thought they did a very good job uh, with what they did. They made, a, they made a PG-13 RoboCop, and they made it for the world, and they made it with the, the emerging Chinese uh, market, uh, you know, in mind, as they should should have. Uh, so, right. you know, and what's, what has saved it, and I always thought it might, uh, from, you know, I mean, because it was not widely loved here, and it was very expensive, apparently, because they really put their hearts into it, right. both MGM and the director. Uh, so, you know, but because of China, they may make another one, which is great, because I'm really happy when it goes on. Yeah, you know, and, and, there, and the thing I really liked about both RoboCops was that the original RoboCop that you and Mike wrote and worked on, um, you know, a lot of that, those concepts in there for being 1987 really predicted a lot of where we're at and where we're continuing to head right now. And the, the new RoboCop, you know, took what um, you and Mike kind of created and just kind of updated it and, and said, well, you know, that one pretty much predicted, you know, kind of where we're, we're at and heading, you know, now I'm going to take um, what, you know, you guys did and update it, you know, with current events going on now and then kind of taking what you and Mike started and taking it to you know, the next level because, you know, we're, it's a different time. But well, well, it is, it is, it is, you know, listen, I'm really happy that the original lives on in so many people's imagination uh, and continues to be regarded well. Um, 
you know, the, the new one is made for a different time and they right. just can't make a movie. Although I would argue that if you didn't spend so much money, you could make a, a really great hard action picture that was a lot of fun right. and would have tones that, you know, RoboCop had. But there, you know, that's, you really have to make it cheaply because they can't, that, that doesn't work for the formulas, the market formulas they have. In other words, they're, they're, they're out. They, each studio has X number of slots a year that they can claim and that they can market a, a, a picture to. And they are looking each one of those slots. They want it to do well here. They want it to do well in Europe. And they want it to do well in China. And if they do that, like with Fast and Furious 7, they can make so much money that everybody just jumps around and has a great time for a couple of years. You know, right. so that's what they're trying to do. And they really don't want to do anything else. They're not even incentivized to do anything else. Why would you if that's the game? So as a result, the you know, what what used to be called adult dramas and certain kinds of niche film you know, niche films like action films even, you don't make the same way. Or can't. There's not even a marketplace for them, it seems like. You know. Right, right, because you know what, you know, going back to Schwarzenegger and Stallone, you know, you, you don't see action movies made anymore, you know, like they were made with when those two guys, you know, were at, at their at their peak. I you guess know. you would say the Fast and Furious movies are kind of our version of that action movie now. Yeah. Yeah, I would agree with that. They're kind know. of big guys who were punching each other all the time. Right. Right, and it was actually in uh in the rundown, um, which was The Rock's uh you know first big right. um action movie film. Really, um, at the very beginning, when he's like called in to take care of you know getting the money from whoever he has to get it from, he's actually walking through the nightclub, you know, in like into the the dance area, and Arnold Schwarzenegger. Um, walks by him and says to him like something like, you know, you handle it now, so, something like that. It's and a trade off. It's a handoff. That's exactly what it was because I remember um, going to see that movie in theaters and seeing like an interview with um, Schwarzenegger and The Rock, and um, Schwarzenegger and The Rock were basically talking about why that scene was in there, and Schwarzenegger basically said that that was his way of handing down the torch to who he thought, you know, was the next Schwarzenegger in a sense. And well, they have a lot in common. They have a lot. They both have a great deal of charisma with the camera. That's, right. that's the key to who they are. I mean, they, those guys communicate to the camera, and that's what they do really well. Um, that's why they're movie stars. Exactly. It's just, you know... I, I, I love Commando. Commando is is such a just classic, you know, um, blow them up, get the bad guys, beat the shit out of them movie. And, you know, and it's also in terms of writing, you know, it's, it's Stephen E. D'Souza, who's, you know, another one of my great inspirations. But, um, you know, talk about, you know, the times. Uh, Commando was, I think... I think it was like 1984, um, and and in terms of writing, um, you you you're told everything you need to know um, within the first not even 20 minutes of the movie. Um, there you go. That's a very very good thing to contemplate. That idea right there. Everything you ought to know. Everything you need to know as soon as you can know it. Right. No such thing as a su good surprise in a movie. It's only a well-engineered surprise that works. Right. You know, and it's just that that type of writing is is great, but it's also that that isn't done anymore. It, why, you know, why do you think that's true? Well, not not in the sense of like of like a straight up action movie. You know, I I think with with action movies today. Um, you know, there there's a little bit of, uh, a little bit of you know mystery to, to what's what's going to happen. You know, yes, you're still told, but 
I, I, I can't remember really seeing a great action movie in, since, you know, the 2000s up to now that I, I, I'm told, you know, within the first really 10 minutes, you know, everything that I need to know that sets it up for the rest of the film. Um, mm-hmm. Or at least not done in, in, you know, a clever, not, a, not you know, a clever way, but a way that, um, you know, it, it tells you outright, but you're still in for the ride 110%. So, so I guess you're saying that audience, the, you know, there's a sense that the audiences have seen all those versions where they know everything up front. So now we're playing around and being a little more mysterious. Even Pulp Fiction is doing that with its time schemes. Yeah. And we're saying, well, it's this, it's that. It's, it's a little more nonlinear, and you're supposed to put a puzzle together. It's a little more, I, I actually call it impressionist. It's a little bit of a, in some ways, impressionism, I think. Yeah, uh, exactly. Is that yeah, exactly? I don't know. Do you, do you, I mean, I don't think you can ever go back. Uh, do, you, do, you, do you think, what, what are the best, what are the films you like the most these days? What are the best films? Is it, do you like Chris Nolan? Who do you like? I do like Christopher Nolan. Um, I, I'll tell you what, I'm, a, I'm really a huge fan of Guillermo del Toro. Uh, I think Gio, that, Guillermo. Yeah, yeah, Guillermo. Yes, right. Yeah. Right. Um, he, he's I, I the real deal. deal. Yeah. You know, I, I think he knows how to write a script well. He knows how to direct the vision of it well. Um, he knows how to cast it just right. Um, and the, the thing I love about him the most is, you know, he uses the perfect amount of practical makeup effects and CG, you know, computer effects. And yeah, he, he's, a, he's a, one of the guys who's committed to changing up and not only doing one thing. I think that's just, that's a, I would say in the, the future is that we are going to have hopefully subtler uses of CG and uh, that people will, will, will blend them so you really, you're not sure what the eye is right. seeing. And right, that's cause, that's cause, the way if you can do it. Right, because my only my main complaint with a lot of movies that are coming out these days, actually specifically um, horror, is that they they use too much CG. Well, and it pulls you out, doesn't it? It's it does. An anti, it's an anti visceral experience. It makes you think, and when you're thinking, the movie, you know, I I, I don't know how else to say. It. It, movies aren't about thinking. Movies are about experiencing. And when you're thinking, you're you're removed. And so when you see a bad CG shot, or you go, "Oh, that's not quite right," your eye catches it. It bugs you. It throws you out. Right, like uh, you know, John Carpenter's The Thing. Um, yes. Versus the the prequel that they made in like two thousand nine. My, my, my buddy Rob Bottin is the, and you know, John Carpenter's no slouch, but. The effects work and what they were doing there that was meant to fool the eye and astound you, and that really is a performance by Rob Bottin also, uh, is something that you know you can't get with CGI. You can get it with the right CGI supervisor guy who's really an animator and artist, but it's really hard and it right. doesn't always work. You know? Right, you know, because you know, I, I I did like the prequel that they they made back in like two thousand nine or two thousand ten, twenty eleven, whenever that was. But the uh, my only complaint with that one was the fact that you know the the thing effects were all CG, and a lot of people, my friends and everything, they that flat out made them didn't they just did not like. Uh, the prequel that they did, The Carpenters, solely based on that reason. And, you know, me, you know, I'm like, I I liked it. I did, you know, because it showed you what happened to the camp um, before uh, Carpenters. And you got to see, like, the actual inside of the ship and everything, which you only saw, you know, the outside of it in Carpenters. But, you know, nevertheless, I will say that the CG effects versus where they definitely could have easily have done uh, practical makeup effects, you know, took me out of it a little bit, even though I still enjoyed the film. 
Yeah, I don't know. That's that is always the um, challenge that you have to deal with when you're doing makeup and how it integrates into the movie is 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 tricky. And that's why it's not often done. You know, it's it's often more theatrical looking, even when it's done well. And and the really good filmmakers can pull stuff off that way where you don't see it or it or you accept it. Uh, right. you know, and then going back to Paul with Starship Troopers, that's 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 a perfect example. You know, there's no way you know the the bugs could have been practical effects. Doing well, we like, have some. We did build practical hydraulic bugs. There's no, a no, no. I, I, I know, I know that. Um, but like in terms of you know showing like swarms of them and a lot yeah. of like the big you know action effects with them, you could not do that with with practical. But like the close up shots where, um, uh, what is her name? Um, well, uh, you know, De Dez is a. Uh, yeah. I mean, D D Dizzy or Dina. Right, Dizzy, yeah. Um, you know, she's she gets uh, you know at, towards the 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 end. When she when, gets when you mean the but the attack on her, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and she gets you know impaled by the uh, the arachnids, um, you know, mouth or claws or whatever. Um, you know, part of that was CG and part of it was practical with you know hydraulically made um, you know arachnid effects and everything. But never, but you know the, the the scenes where you know like you had uh you know the the flying uh bugs come in on the attack and um and they, they, you know they chop off some dude's you know head you know like you see the 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 CG is the 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 flying bug but the practical is actually seeing like the the head or whatever get chopped off of the the soldier and seeing him fall you know and well, yeah the 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 head was also a, a animation idea when it flies up in the air the funny thing about that shot you're talking about is the, the it's an a vista the vista vision shot which is a larger uh, image area than the frame that you see the the head loops up at, in in the shot you see the head goes up and comes down it goes out of frame it comes down but in the in the vista vision plate you see it it's full trajectory and arc and it's pretty funny uh, it, uh, but yeah the uh, the that's a where you're coordinating your live action stuff and then you're putting it through, you're digitizing everything, you're adding the bug and you're adding the guy's head flying through the air and things like that uh, with a helmet on. Uh, so that's, that's what those guys are doing. The, the thing, the key here though is Phil Tippett is the guy doing it and he's just really good. He's an animator. He understands, uh, you know, pictorial imagery extremely well. He knows how details work he knows how light works it's it's hard to explain otherwise and but it's, it, it, in terms of the relationship to robocop uh you know phil did ed 209 as a stop motion uh creature and by the time uh the next big movie he does is jurassic park and he is fully at the you know he's at the forefront of moving from practical effects into the digital realm and it was because of that because i knew phil and John, I went to, uh, you know, I said, oh, I'm going to go talk to John Davison about doing Starship Troopers. And that's how the movie, that's kind of how the movie really started rolling, which was I, I wrote a little treatment up of a Starship Troopers-like movie that had a kind of a romantic quadrangle in it and um, said, hey, we could do this now because we can do the bugs. And, and it was so without Jurassic. Uh, Again, thank you, George Lucas. Without George Lucas, the right, uh, Starship right. Troopers would not have been uh, a, a, a movie you could have made. Exactly, you know, and and you know, George has 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 definitely made an impression on my 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 whole you know genre uh, style, if you will, you know, um, along with you know you and Mike and, and Paul and. Uh, well, yeah, and, and George is the guy who, who, who enables a lot of this storytelling. I mean, the reason comic book heroes are so popular right now is because George Lucas it provided the effects base by which you could realize those things. Exactly. And so, you know, I don't know if George likes that part of it, uh, but uh, it's true anyway. 
Uh, there's some great tools out there, and people can make movies now in their living room or their bedroom if they have the discipline. Right, right. It's a lot of work, though. You know, and I just, you know, one of the things I lo I'd love to see, you know, if, if I ever get anything that, you know, I'm currently writing and I'm going to write made, um, one of them, I, I'm, I'm for my, my senior uh, thesis class this year, um, I'm writing a uh, film noir horror film. Um, oh, cool. It focuses on um, the Native American legends of, of skinwalkers. And, um, and I'm also working on a uh, car cartoon show, um, some uh, an another horror sci-fi film based on the actual legend of gargoyles. You know, so a lot of the stuff that like I'm I'm writing and envisioning has has been pure main influence of, you know, the classic um, 80s horror sci fi genres. So that means, you know, anything from, you know, work of Paul Verhoeven to, you know, stuff that you've written and Mike has written to. Um, John Carpenter to the, you know, the late, great Wes Craven, um, Stuart Gordon, you know, the whole, uh, the whole, you know, Lovecraft team that brought us like Reanimator and From Beyond and all that, you know, I mean, there's, there's so many people, you know, out there that may really contributed and made their mark in, in the eighties and has just, just totally. So the eighties, you know, do, do you think the eighties has become a uh, special film, or or is it maybe just um, like genre film and action films? No, I I think the eighties, um, not just for uh, horror, not just for sci fi, not just for action. I think for um, I think for uh, drama. I think for comedy. You know, I I, I think the eighties really. Um, you know, was was the decade that set the page for um, everything of the '90s, 2000s, and now in the 2010s uh, to be able to happen? Um, because comedies, comedies were in the '70s compared to comedies in the '80s are completely different. Um, you know, with the emergence of Belushi and Aykroyd and and, uh, yeah, that, that that period. I would say Richard Pryor is a oh Pryor. Really, I, was, I was going to say Pryor and yeah, Wilder. Pryor is kind of this for me because I was a kid growing up in the Bay Area. In this, you know, Pryor. When I look back on it, Pryor had an immense effect on me. It, you know, and and I would say Pryor. You can see Pryor in the kind of humor that is suffused in RoboCop, uh, you know, maybe even in Starship, because it's very much like, you know, it's a takedown of the establishment world. It's a kick in the ass of what people, what all those stuff shirts are saying, which is really what, what guys like Pryor were doing in stand-up and in film. You look at Blazing Saddles. Exactly. Which, you know, and stuff like that. And that had a big impact on me because I was 15, 16. It was just the right age. One of the right. great things I ask about, uh, I'll give you this, you should try it with your guests, is, is you can ask anybody what their favorite movie was when they were 13 or 14. And they always go back in time to that movie, whatever it was. And it might have been at 11 and it might have been at uh, – you know, 17. But whatever it is, there's a movie experience everybody has a couple times where they're just taken away by whatever they see. And I've asked that, that question of, you know, people around the world, kings and presidents, if you will. Uh, and they always talk about a movie. So next time you have a guest, you should ask them that question. Well, actually, my, my closing question for all my interviewees is, what are some of your favorite, you know, movies, yeah. whether it be horror, sci-fi, drama, comedy, just what, what are some of your favorite movies in general? Oh, me? Um, <laughs> let's see. Uh, you know, uh, I was going to ask you just to start with horror. Have you seen It Follows? Um, I have, actually. That I, I really liked a lot. Yeah, It Follows, you know, just for the record, I just thought, I'm not a great big horror fan, and I thought that was a pretty smart movie. 
Really well done. Well, good use of Detroit. Uh, beautiful and actually a, a kind of a, a, a chilling central metaphor or idea. It, it, had, it was visual, you know. So anyway, I like, I like that movie. But let's see, what are my favorite movies? You know, I like, I like a lot of movies now. And, I can, uh, and I've watched them back to silence a little bit. Uh, I mean, there's always movies to watch, which is a lovely thing about movies, if you want. Um, you know, I really went through a big period of John Ford and Westerns uh, in my adult life, where I just really studied John Ford for a while. Um, so let's start there because I can, I believe you can see it, a, see it as a big influence in Starship Troopers. That's really a calorie. Oh, absolutely. Thing. Yeah. Well, the whole, and so I didn't even realize it until I was working on, you know, a, I directed a direct to video Starship three and I suddenly went, Oh fuck. I've been, all this John Ford stuff has been in the movies all along, you know, that's <laughs> dope I am. But anyway, so I, you know, there's that, uh, just to go old, uh, Billy Wilder, really important to me. You can see in, in RoboCop, you can see the when, when um, uh, Dick Jones is saying, talking to Bob Morton and calling him Bobby Boy. Right, right. That's direct, direct uh, uh, homage to Wilder, who I once met walking down 3rd Street and said, I want to shake your hand. He looked at me like he thought I was going to knife him or something, but he did. Good man. Uh, so, you know, Billy Wilder, I would say his movies, The Apartment in particular, is just an astounding movie. Um, you know, you can just go on and on. I love Scorsese, obviously. I love Kubrick, very important to me. All of uh, Kubrick's kind of, you know, Dr. Strange love, Clockwork Orange. When Rob Bottin saw some early footage of Robocop, he said, oh my God, it looks like Clockwork Orange. Now, I don't know why he said that, but it was the greatest thing I'd ever, compliment I'd ever heard. That the movie had that kind of vibrancy, scary vibrancy that that, that is achieved in Clockwork. Uh, I like um, uh, what else do I like? Uh, as I say, Kubrick. You know who doesn't like Kubrick? Right. Um, so I've been r rambling on about old movies like uh, The Godfather and, and and movies from the '70s that I think you know and and before. There's a lot of good movies out there that. You can watch and really learn a lot from, uh, as have people like Quentin Tarantino and Martin Scorsese, etc. Um, so I really recommend to everyone out there watch old movies. You know, find the good old movies too, because there are some things to, that you'll see that will delight you. Um, obviously, the contemporary. Uh, uh, there's there's lovely people working right now too that are exciting. I like, um, you know. Um, Paul, uh, Paul Thomas Anderson may be one of my favorite filmmakers ever, and I and I can't wait for his next movie. He's, uh, he's great. I love. I, I do love, love him. Him. Yeah, his stuff is great. Yeah, the Coen brothers are just—they can do no wrong, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, and they're just great, great, great. Uh, I wish they would make more movies, but uh, they seem to do—they seem to do well all by themselves. Um, you know. You know, those kind of exciting filmmakers, uh, I can't wait to get more of. Um, uh, like Brad Bird when he's operating uh, on uh, at his best. Uh, I like um, I like Christopher Nolan, uh, particularly Inception and the second Batman movie. I think are great movies, and uh, so I just wish there were more people making wonderful original films right now. And. Uh, uh, it's not that we're, again, we're making different kind of films. We're making films for the world, and that's its own delight, I guess. Um, so, uh, anyway, what about you? What are your favorite films these days? Tell me something. Well, um, Inception was definitely probably my, my favorite uh, Christopher Nolan film um, in the 2000s. Uh, Memento would have to be, like, starting off... Um, Good movie. Great movie. And Guy Pierce is just he's he's excellent in anything he's in. Yep. Um Inception though, that that was that movie was probably one of like the most original and as well as visually entertaining um films that I, I've seen in a long time. Um yep. I, 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 I loved movies. Um, where it leaves it off on like an open um, interpretation. Yeah, it's a, it's it had a lot of um, 
kind of uh, it achieved a lot of big movie moments actually, where you went, "Wow, I'm 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 swept away by this." And uh, that's uh, say what you like about Christopher Nolan, but he can do that. Right, right. Um, I'm trying to think who else I really like. Uh, uh, what's his name? The guy who just directed Birdman. Um, oh, Alessandro. Yeah. Uh, in Iraq too. Very interesting guy, obviously. Yeah, and the guy who did Gravity also. Uh, yeah, because uh, I love Children of Men. That, yeah, Children of that... Men is great. Children of Men is good. Have you seen City of... Uh, there's a lot of exciting stuff happening south of the border, as we once said. Um, City of God, if anybody hasn't seen that, they ought to check that out. That's a nice piece of filmmaking. That's a great uh, movie. I have seen that. That's... That that is that is an intense film. Um, it's pretty intense, but it's really it's kind of yeah. a one piece of filmmaking. And when I when I find a movie like that, which I do every now and again, I often often will sit down with it, and you can do it now and, and study it, watch it a few times, and 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 rewatch sequences. And uh, uh, that one, that guy really made a, a great film. A lot of people who are a lot of talented people who are now DPs and. It started on that film. That's the river runs through it of of, of Brazilian filmmaking. I mean, it, it's a great movie. It really is. And, and it's if, you know, people actually go and watch that movie and then read up on um, on the actual actors that were in it. I mean, you know, they're, they're basically like living that life right now. Um, and... It's, uh, you know, like for where p people think, you know, doing one movie, you know, even as a kid, you know, can set you for life. It's the exact opposite. And um, it, well, it, it can, you know, but mo in most cases, it doesn't always work out that way. And the, the I don't want to like reveal too much about what that movie is about without giving away, you know, a whole bunch of the, the plot. But um, let me just say to my listeners out there that uh, it, it's definitely a very intense film and will be a, a very big wake-up call um, for interpretation of, you know, the, the South American, um, life, you know, living situation, if you, if you will. Um but it, it's it's an excellent film. Yeah, yeah, I can't wait to see uh, the new uh, the Revenant, which is yeah. an Ratu film. That what you are you excited about? That? I am excited for that because I I think Leonardo DiCaprio has like deserved an Oscar for so many movies he's been in, um, and I, I really hope he he gets it for this one. Um, I saw the preview for it and. Tom Hardy is also one of my favorite actors that's out there right now. Um, and the two of them in that just looks great. Yeah, that's he, he is an intense guy, Mr. Hardy. Uh, I hope he survives to do some more films. No, uh, yeah. he sounds like a, a trip to be around. Um, did you? Uh, I presume you like Mad Max uh, Fury Road. I don't think I have gone to see a movie in theaters more than once in, in, since, uh, since Predators came out. And um, I saw Mad Max Fury Road uh, three times in, in theaters uh, during its, its release over this past summer. And I enjoyed it uh, just the same each time I saw it. Yeah, it's uh, anyway. That's 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 that is why we like movies because you can actually go back to them and right. look at them again, right? Uh, and and again and again and again. Uh, um, well, listen, it's been a pleasure to talk with you and your audience today. I I, I hope uh, I hope you can cut something out of all this that makes sense of what we've said. And if you want to talk again and you want me on camera or on Skype, let me know and we can do it. Absolutely. That, that sounds great. Um, Ed Numier, it's been great having you on the fishbowl. Um, if you know anyone that would like to do an interview, please help, you know, spread the word of the fishbowl. And, uh, it's, it's been a pleasure having you. All right. Well, good luck with all your projects. Keep writing, keep creating. We need more good movies now.
Uh, absolutely. Uh, I'm, I'm se senior year. I'm hoping to get out there as soon as possible. You're the next. I'm handing the torch off to you, buddy. Come on. All right. All right. It's Ed Newmier handing the torch down. That That's I, – I accept. I accept. All right. Good. Good. The right <laughs> answer. All right. Hey, take care. Let's uh, keep in touch. Absolutely. Thank you again. See you later. Bye. Bye.